welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Max, here with Greg Uttinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we are going to attempt to cover all the rest of Play-Doh that we have not already... No, that's not what we're doing. We are, <laughs> We have chosen three specific platonic ideas <laughs> to bring to you today. Um... Uh, they are arranged. There are three of them, as I mentioned. They are arranged according to the three branches of philosophy, sort of. More accurately, the three aspects of the image of God and man, because those are the three things that Plato messes up, essentially. Is it the three things that everybody messes up? You're, you're making funny faces at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, prophet, king, and priest. So we will start with the branch of philosophy that corresponds to man's prophetic nature, uh, the nature of knowledge and truth and how we know what we know. That would be epistemology. Uh, Plato's most famous contribution to epistemology would be the allegory of the cave. How does that how does that go? It, apparently, if you've seen The Matrix, it's that. I yeah, haven't seen much. The Matrix. You haven't um, seen The Matrix? No, everything yeah, I know yeah. about The Matrix is from Bible and philosophy classes. <laughs> Don't watch any of the sequels, but the first one is worth it. The first one you need, to, you need to watch. And then I can give you my book that shows you how it's a blend of 10 different philosophies and oh. worldviews. Uh, what book is it? Or are you saving it for recommendations? Oh, I guess I could. <laughs> or you could tell me about it now. Either way is fine. It's called The Matrix and Philosophy. <laughs> oh, wow. Didn't I read it one in coming. one of my uh, political science college classes that was called From Marx to the Matrix, uh, basically tracking the infiltration of Marxism into lots of different places in our culture. So That would be so fun. Hillsdale College just released a free online course that's the history of Marxism and communism, and I'm so excited. But let's get to the allegory of the cave. <laughs> Yeah, it's for free. It's asynchronous. You don't even have to like finish the course. You'll just get annoying emails if you don't. It'll be like, I hey, like, I would you're take that one with you. Percent done with yes. this course. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Uh, <laughs> nice. Well, Emily, didn't you read uh, the Republic like yeah. a couple weeks ago? <laughs> so you've read the Allegory of the Cave more recently than the rest of us. Oh, are you going to make me summarize it? I was kind of thinking I might, yeah. Oh, but you people, know. People like to hear you talk. <laughs> one one listener said, she's a sharp woman. Said, of course. That was really nice of her. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now I'm afraid I'll disillusion her. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the allegory of the cave is a story that Plato tells in the Republic. The concept is basically you have a cave, surprisingly enough. Um, in the cave, there is a fire, and the fire is casting light on one of the walls of the cave. Well, presumably all the walls of the cave, but there's one that matters because between the cave wall and the fire, there are puppets, basically, shadow puppets passing back and forth images. So as the, the images move, the, the shadows are cast on the wall. Um, between, in the, in the middle of the cave, in the midst of the cave... Um, shackled for some reason, um, are some people who can see the shadows moving on the wall of the cave, but they can't see the fire and they can't see the puppets. It's like a movie theater. You mm. just see the image cast on the wall in front of you. You don't see what's casting the image. And that is kind of what Plato suggests reality is like. But what we perceive is kind of the shadow and we don't really see what's making what really is. Um, but then he goes on to tell a story where someone, for some reason, who was shackled for some reason, uh, is suddenly free and finds his way out of the cave. And he escapes and he sees the sun, real light for the first time in his life, and real ducks going by, quack, 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 as Gretchen would say. Um, we know a song about that. Um, <laughs> but so he sees the, the realities that were imitated by the shadows on the wall. And once he has seen the reality, he goes back into the cave and tries to tell the people who are still chained there about the real life that he's seen, the truth, the truth behind his situation. Now he sees the fire, he sees the puppets casting the shadows, um, and the other people think he's crazy because they're, 
they've never seen anything like what he's describing. It's totally foreign to them. Um, and that's kind of what Plato suggests the life of a philosopher is like, like you've got this knowledge and nobody believes you, which, you know, one more layer of cohesion to the story, I think, is that like coming back into the dark place from the light place, the guy's eyes would have to adjust, right? Mm -hmm. So he's coming back into the darkness and suddenly he can't even see the shadows as clearly as he used to because he's become accustomed to the outside world. So that's the, the gist of the allegory. Would you say that's fair? Yeah. I appreciate that you compared it to a movie theater because that's basically what Plato did. He described a movie theater, um, I don't know, 2,000 years before they were invented or more. <laughs> uh, the, the lessons are, first of all, most of us live in a world of shadow of appearance of illusion and we're okay with that and there of course is truth to this we're satisfied with sound bites and commercials and celebrity status and are generally quite incapable of thinking deeply or critically anyhow uh the next step is that well there's this fire but it's pretty close at hand and the the man who turns out eventually to be the philosopher <clears throat> is able to to break out and and to go look at that, and, and he sees that there's more to what's going on than the average person can discern. The big thing, though, is when he goes to the surface world and sees the original of all these things, the real duck, the real bear, the real horse, the real man, he can see himself. And then finally he lifts his eyes to the sun, which is absolutely dazzling, but is the source of all light and heat and, and light for everything. And and he tries to tell people, and if it's possible, they actually try to kill him because mm -hmm. no one wants their worldview upset. This leads, and, and that so first thing, allegory of the cave leads directly to what most people think about Plato, although he didn't spend all that much time talking about his doctrine of forms and ideals or ideas. Plato in, in the Republic is not so concerned about epistemology. He ends there. He talks about how great it is to be a philosopher and how philosophers should be kings and kings philosophers and all that. But mostly he's looking at the way you make a city state, a polis work, and tries to find justice in there, the idea of justice. And those who know the idea, philosophers who have studied such things, obviously incarnate that virtue, that abstraction, better than anybody else, and so we should trust them. To generalize, then, uh, he postulates that there are ideas, universals, uh, original analogs, um, archetypes. For everything, there is the ideal chair. There's the ideal dog, or dogness, if you will. <laughs> the ideal human being, the ideal hairdo, the ideal wedding, you know, everything. He's not, but Plato wasn't concerned about most of that. He's concerned about justice and particularly beauty and truth and goodness, the idea of the good. What is that? And if we could lay our minds on it, then we'd all be good. So let's all be philosophers and contemplate goodness in the abstract. And the consequence is that we will all be good, and society will be good, and the polis will be good. Oh, wait, we just slipped into ethics, too. So, yeah, <laughs> epistemology to metaphysics, to what, what's real, to ethics, to how shall we then live. Um, the um, philosophers and writers in philosophy, it's, it's philosophers, it's historians of philosophy, there you go. Spent a lot of time talking about about these these forms and these ideals. A couple things just in passing, because I think it's easy for Christians who do a superficial reading of well Wikipedia or Britannica or something to not understand what Plato's saying. These are not ideas in the mind of God. These predate or antecede or have precedence over whatever gods there may be. Mm -hmm. These things exist as ideas or ideals, forms he calls them that are the archetypes for everything in physical reality. Where so you could even they? extrapolate that there is a form of godhood yeah. to which the gods should conform 
if they're mm-hmm. good. And like that comes up in Plato. He d- he does have this idea that there should be a god that's good, um, which is his preconceived notion of this is the f- the form of god. So there should be one that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, one would hope. One would think. Um, and. So when when Christians approach this, it's easy to say, so what he's thinking about basically is, well, we would say ideas in the mind of God. Well, we would, he wouldn't. (laughs) Right. Uh, So (laughs) we're we're confusing categories there big time when we try to do that. Mm -hmm. For Plato, there is no absolute self-contained infinite God who is self-defining. There may be gods of some sort, but they, as you just said, they have to they have a standard outside themselves to live up to if they really want to be gods. Mm-hmm. They need to get their act together and be more godlike. They need to perceive the idea of godness or the good or justice or truth or beauty. And as they come to know it, they will be more godlike. And, and thus us. We need to perceive these things too. And we will be more truly human in the best sense of the word. And our city-state will be more truly a good society. Plato also talks about a uh, character he calls the Demiurge, which is is a Greek word that basically means city worker. (laughs) You know, those people who have hard hats and orange jackets, at least in California, and hold signs and move things around and make things happen. Uh, This is the closest he gets to talking about a god. This Demiurge uh, contemplates the forms, the ideas the archetypes. And then he takes pre-existent matter. He does not create out of it, out of nothing. That's not on the table any place. Um, but with the pre-existent matter, he tries to mold a universe, a cosmos that approximates that. But he's working with inferior materials. He himself is not self-defining an infinite. So, you know, we get what we get and shouldn't throw too much of a fit over it. Questions There's this assumption com- that that matter is less than form, yeah, um, and so it yes. would be the a god would be dirtying his hands mm-hmm. to be working with matter, and so the demiurge comes in. Yeah, the demiurge is not exactly a god. Um, he's certainly not. He's not God. He's 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 hired help. He's something, but he will show up in other um, philosophies and in Christian heresies and such, as the step in between. Because as you say, because matter is um, sickly icky. and icky. Yeah, icky is a good word. Matter <laughs> is icky. So a good God can't touch it. So we have this in-between thing that that works with it. Um, some of the Gnostic heretics later identified the Demiurge with the God of the Old Testament. He was allowed to do stuff like that. But the God and Father of Jesus Christ, who is sheer love and truth, he would never make a world or interact with sin or have anything to do with such things. He is just pure overflowing goodness. And if the Old Testament God, who is something of a bully, wants to work with that, maybe, maybe that just means that he's Satan. The Gnostics were, as my wife would say, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Um, <laughs> so, you, you, you know, you could... You could, and and people have written whole books on Plato, just to sum up what we've done. There's not a lot left, honestly. You can you can talk through um, fine points, and you can argue, did he mean this or did he mean that? For instance, here's one: the demiurge and all of that. Is that did he really believe that, or is it just an allegory for the way reason structures reality? Can we know, and do we care? Well, a lot of people do because they think Plato is some kind of um, prophet, but for the rest of us, uh, not so. No, <laughs> the guy. The idea has had its influence on the history of philosophy. Regardless. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes, it has. There, are another question, sort of along those lines, is: Did uh, Plato read Moses? The early Church Fathers generally thought he had, and they probably were right. The only problem is they thought that. He profited, I think we would say, and he distorted. <laughs> he he stole, borrowed, twisted, and and completely ignored what Genesis one actually says about the God who made the universe. So we're we're back to this modern Christian infatuation with Plato. 
it, it's not far distant from what we find in the church fathers, who were always looking for something in Greek culture that they could see as uh, a Greek equivalent, a pagan equivalent of what God had done for Israel and the lambs and the feasts and the sacrifices in the temple and the priesthood. Surely God gave them some kind of forerunner, some kind of idea that l l laid down the path, the breadcrumbs to the cross. Not really. No, they had. <laughs> well, Israel even wasn't that Israel far away. They could and go the talk the scriptures to, to Israel. <laughs> they were, yeah, that's how they were supposed to find out. <laughs> yeah, they could go talk to Israel. And during in the days of Solomon, in the days of um, uh, the Persian kings, the, the the Bible was there. It was available. It's not. We we sometimes think of well, God kept His word reserved for Israel until Jesus came. No, He didn't. <laughs> uh, that, that's kind of like saying no one in the world has ever heard of the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. <laughs> Everybody's heard of them, and whether or not they do them any good is something else. But the shot the, was heard around the world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the the ideas contained in Scripture were very familiar to the ancient world, except the ancient world usually, like today's world, simply despised them and didn't want to listen. And or the pick, philosophers pick rarely chose. admitted, like Hammur yeah. Hammurabi. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Hammurabi at some points, is a he just photocopied from Moses. <laughs> oh, and the, some of uh, Rome's laws are almost word for word for Moses. Of course, liberals will say, oh, so that's where Moses got the idea. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Works the other <laughs> and way. And that's why chronology is important. <laughs> that's why chronology is important. So we know who came first and who borrowed from whom or stole from whom without credit, without footnoting. That's why <laughs> footnotes are important, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're keeping track on the roadmap at home, we've covered epistemology and mm. metaphysics, and then we're going to cover briefly something sort of ethicky, if you will, <laughs> um, which would be Plato's doctrine of the soul, which is vaguely what, Greg? <sighs> vaguely, uh, well, let's let, let's skip the vagueness and go directly for what he said. He thought that the human soul is divine and eternal. That is, there is the spark of a deity which exists before a man is born. It's thrust into this world. It's thrust into a body of clay. Uh, and that's rather shocking. And in the process, this little spark of godhood forgets where it was and what it was and how it was. And it spends the rest of its life remembering. And what it needs to remember is this very world of forms, archetypes, ideas, whatever you want to call them, that we've been talking about. Because as immortal, a piece of God, it once was face to face with these things. Oh, one thing in passing. Christians are, because we want to make the connection between Plato and Christianity, sometimes we think of this place where forms exist as a sort of form heaven. So mm -hmm. over here's in this corner of heaven are the form animals, and over here are the form pieces of architecture, and over here are the form. Ideas don't exist in places. They're ideas. And there's no <laughs> single divine mind that contains them. So the whole question of, well, where are these things? They're not anywhere, because awareness involves material existence. Mm -hmm. Well, what is their mode of, mode of existence? Well, we don't know, except, well, we did once, but then we got born and we forgot everything. So Christians can talk in a very different um, strain about God's eternal knowledge and um, the his plans, his ideas, his definitions. Um, but it's not what Plato's talking about. And can we talk for just a second about how sad this is? That Go proceed. For, for Plato, <laughs> dogness is good, but your dog, you. Yeah. Um, your neighbor's dog, gross. Yeah. Um, there's there's no room here for the delights of diversity. If mm -hmm. there's a form of grapeness, you only get one variety of grape. I was just enjoying some grapes from our friend's grapevine that are the same varietal that my mom grew in my backyard growing up. You can't buy mm -hmm. them in a store because they're too fragile, mm -hmm. but they're the best grapes in the world, in my opinion. Um, and I love that there are all these different kinds of grapes and apples and peaches and strawberries. You know, you don't get that if there's a form of apple 
that's the one no, good. No, because the, the, the ideal apple or the ideal grape is ideal. And despite yeah. the fact that you are deluded by the diversity of the world you <laughs> encounter into thinking that these individual things are the best there could be, you're simply wrong. Yeah. Poor and little thing. Only, you think those things are nice. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you don't. You don't know. Uh, well, and, and also so, it, it means that there's no incentive to actually develop this creation and to make it mm -hmm. better and to improve uh, because it's the shadow, it's not the substance, and mm -hmm. it's not worth anything. Um, so why would we try to improve on what we have or cultivate and grow and take dominion? Yeah. There's no point Footnote. to it. See Ecclesiastes. It's just so <laughs> fortuitous that we're doing Ecclesiastes in Bible study at the same time we're talking about Plato. It just no. keeps coming back. <sighs> so the soul for Plato then <laughs> is the spark of divinity that's trapped in some kind of material existence and is trying to remember the world that was. And as it encounters this dog or that dog, this grape or that grape, it is reminded of ideal dogs and ideal the ideal grape <laughs> from its prior existence and and that's that's the nature of learning that's how we come to learn and know things we're remembering what we already do because you know god like and all that we were more or less omniscient we knew everything we were in touch with everything but we've lost it and we're trying to remember uh, now one one thing to say about platonic mysticism since the Romantic era in, in Western civilization, we tend to think of the soul in terms of emotion. We think of mystical experience as an emotional experience. There's that a touch of that in Plato and of the Greeks, but primarily for the Greeks, for Plato, the soul is intellect. It is mm -hmm. reason. Yeah. It's abstract reason. It can get an abstract reason can get pretty weird. But this isn't about having an emotional experience or a drug trip as such. You can go see the uh, the mystery cults if you want to do that. Uh, but, but it would be an intellectual experience. It's an However, intellectual experience. we must remember that the Greek word for soul is psuche. So it would yeah. be a psychic experience. A because psychic that experience. distinction was not, it was not a distinction. Yeah, they're, they're still <laughs> trying to to make sense of this without any help from from scripture. What what rises the well, let's get to the ethics. What rises out mm -hmm. of this then is that the soul, the reason, needs to remember, understand these ideals: justice, goodness, truth, beauty, and all that. And in understanding them, remembering them, it becomes identified with them, and thus becomes those things. The man who studies true justice becomes more just. The man who studies beauty becomes a conveyor of beauty. And, and there's the ethical dimension. We are tied to a reality by a thin line, and as we nurture that thin line, we become sort of like these ultimate realities. And they are ultimate. They are absolute. They are archetypical. We can say we don't like them, but we didn't make them. Neither did anybody else. They're just always been there for some reason or no reason. And um, our, our ethics are how shall we then live? comes out of uh, our conformity to that other dimension, that intellectual psychic realm that contains all these uh, architect archetypes of, of beauty and truth and love and justice and you know go down the list. Um, there are no there are no rules, there are no laws, there are no commandments. Uh, Plato is never going to turn around and say, thou shalt not commit adultery, um, uh, let alone condemn homosexuality. That's another story that we're going to have to talk about next time. Uh, these are things that, as you come to know these things, you will simply become what you ought to be. And if you don't have the time to study them, poor you, oh, isn't it too bad you're not a philosopher? Which is to say, isn't it too bad that you have an independent income so that you can sit around and think about these things and write about them, talk <laughs> about them, and let uh, slaves and women do all the work? Stinks to be you, I guess. But <laughs> one day when all philosophers are kings and all kings are philosophers, then the Republic may see the light of day. This should be kind of scary, I think. 
Well, one of the things that came to my mind immediately is he is presuming that education will always lead to a positive Mm. end and that as we are educated, it basically sparks something within us that pushes us towards the ideals. But I was thinking how untrue that is in that we see those who study the beauty of art and nowadays so much of the art produced is honestly ugly. Mm -hmm. Um, They look at the beauty of the past and they want to be new and different. And so they make things that are ugly because that's how they actually see the world. Um, Where you have lawyers, they study the law. That does not (laughs) make them just. (laughs) There's a reason they have the reputation they do. Most of them know how to manipulate it in order to get around justice. Um, You even have those who go to seminary and therefore should be We would say Mm. the best of Christians, and they're often those that lead everybody astray and are at the front of all the heresies. Um, We know in general that education is not what makes us good, and it's not what sparks the divine goodness in us, even from a Christian perspective, because our minds are as um, fallen as any of the rest of us. But that's been one of the things that the West has held up as an uh, the unfallen part of man. And so that's where Plato has really fed the Western uh, ideas within the church and outside mm-hmm. is we love our intellect and our mind um, and where we see lots of things to this day where we truly hate our bodies and the physical mm-hmm. world. Um, I was just listening to a podcast and reading a book that uh, is discussing how all of the modern trends Mm -hmm. that we're seeing are all variations on Gnosticism and a hatred of the body. Um, And basically our true identity is somewhere Mm -hmm. else besides our body. Um, Think of the whole transgenderism thing of my body does not define Mm -hmm. my, Mm -hmm. who I am. My identity is this other amorphous thing. So I need to make the world conform to what I know to be true out there somewhere. Uh, all of these things, we were presuming that we have this capacity to know that is disconnected from the physical world. Yeah. I remember asking um, my Western heritage professor, I think, while we were reading Plato's Republic, and she was a Roman Catholic, and uh, the Roman Catholic Church has done a lot to preserve the philosophy of Plato. Mm-hmm. Um, and Aristotle. And Aristotle. And I asked, so is man's reason fallen? And she legitimately, I think, did not understand the question. (laughs) It was just so reason. Reason isn't like a capacity of man. Reason is out there. Reason is its own thing. Um, So the, the idea that man's intellect has been tainted by the fall is pretty key and pretty noisome in its absence. And noisy in its absence, both um, (laughs) in Plato. Anything else before I start my own tirade? Those are excellent things. I'm just I'm just gonna throw out like I feel like by personality I'm an anti Gnostic, where the Gnostics are like, oh, we gotta preserve the secret knowledge for the elites. And I'm like, I have been inflicted with this information (laughs) 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 and you need to hear it too, so you can be Mm. made unhappy also. So I I, I do feel like I'm not quite the person to go critiquing Gnosticism because I will do it for the wrong reasons. Uh, Interesting observation. I guess I find myself in between. I'm interested in the screwy and bizarre and such. But then I do feel that probably there's something there that people should know and I need to tell them. (laughs) But as I grow older, I'm learning not to make too much of a fuss about it because... (laughs) Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, and it's really <laughs> not going to change a lot anyway. What's far more important is the gospel. So, uh, and, and what Plato, and, and so bless my tirade, what Plato does, despite what many of our Christian brothers and sisters seem to think, is he completely undermines and destroys the gospel. First of all, the soul is divine for Plato. Well, for Scripture, it's created. Mm-hmm. It is... And, and the Bible orig- originally used soul simply to mean the person. Mm-hmm. God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his body um, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The soul is the person in all that he is, 
um, the immaterial and the material, the heart and the body, mm -hmm. um, the mind and the senses, and all of that is, is man. And man, by his own choice, is fallen, and that fall has tainted everything about him, but most immediately his mind, emotions, and will, so that he seeks to play God. And he rebels against the God who made him and, and has incurred, tr incurred true moral guilt before God as a result. And he deserves to go to hell forever. He deserves the wrath and curse of God. And unless God intervenes, that's what will happen. Uh, Plato just wants us to get rid of our physical, sensual entanglements, remember what we were, um, and then rise above this physical world. The Bible says, no, you, this world, as Rachel said earlier, this world is given you as um, your possession, your inheritance, a place for dominion and service. You don't get to give it up because you're too lazy to do something about it or too <laughs> self-centered or whatever. Uh, and, and thus, the, the nature of salvation is not in avoiding the physical universe. Well, if I don't touch things that that stimulate my body if i stay away from from alcohol and 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 sex even red marital meat. sex red meat yeah okay we can go down that path uh <laughs> the the whole list of do's and don'ts that have been popular in american christendom uh and in other places in the world a lot of it started with us we just passed it on <laughs> um that becomes how you get holy you avoid the physical universe. You don't get involved in politics because that's dirty. You don't have a lot of money because money's evil. You don't, and you just this. You don't listen to music that has any kind of beat because that appeals right to your body, and that's evil. And we just keep going through this whole catalog of things that appeal to our senses, and one by one, we we mark them as wicked and evil. And at the very least, temptations to sin, and we all know that we shouldn't even want to be tempted. So it may not be wrong, but let's not go, let's not go there. Nor should we <laughs> let anyone else go there. Nor should we let, ever let anyone think we might go there because of our testimony. Because mm -hmm. people, you know, people see us drinking, and they might conclude all kinds of horrible things. Salvation becomes this list of rules, and Jesus comes to save us from being creatures, from having physical existence in a physical world. If you ask the average um, young child, and unfortunately often the Christian adult, what does it mean to be saved? They will answer, it means that when you die, you go to be with Jesus. That's or not even salvation. more vaguely, you will go die and go to heaven. You can die and go without to heaven. Without even yeah. mentioning Jesus. Oh yeah, without even mentioning yeah. Jesus, sure. That, there's a word for that. That's called death. <laughs> that's not salvation. And yet that's often what we have reduced it to when over the years now, uh, when I have asked in coming freshman classes to define the gospel, the things that Christians must believe to be Christians, I get a lot of good answers. I occasionally get some really wacky ones. Well, God is this <laughs> force. Um, um, but um, the thing that I for years and years, I simply did not get was the resurrection of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time I got that was when one of our friends, Talitha Farshman, at the time, <laughs> Talitha Rose now, uh, paraphrased the Apostles' Creed. So I believe in God. That, you know, okay, all right. That was a pretty cool way of making sure you had all the bases. But that tells you how many students to that point had not even thought of using the creeds. It didn't. Either they were ignorant of them or they didn't connect them with what was what I was asking. Um, and they certainly did not see them as an outline of the gospel. The, the, Jesus came to save us from sin and its consequences, the obvious consequences being God is our enemy and we die and go to hell. Uh, die. Yeah. So we, God, God accepts us, receives us, forgives us, loves us. We don't die. We live forever in our bodies in a physical new heavens and new earth, a redeemed creation. And we obey and live and serve God and love God in that environment. That's salvation. Um, simply escaping this world and going to heaven, that's a lot closer to Plato than it is to anything in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And it leaves, I mean, of course it leaves out a lot, but to say, well, so that when I die, 
okay, so we're presupposing death. How did death get into the picture? Mm -hmm. Um, There's a whole history of how Jesus defeated death and how we as man brought death into the world by our sin. And and do we even make that connection? Mm-hmm. We we know that Jesus died because he loved us, but then there's that there's the next gap. So what does it have to do with going to heaven? Um, I have asked students, so why did Jesus die? Because he loved us. Yes, but why did that require? Why did that necessitate his, his death? <laughs> yeah, why did he have to die to save us? Well, why why did he have to die to save us? Because he loved us. And I've gotten into that tight little circle, and they cannot see. Well, they're you know usually teenagers who've never been asked to think like this before. They don't get it. They don't understand the question. This is this is the sum total. We love Jesus because he died for us. They don't know what that means. Um, and but they know that somehow that means when I die, I go to heaven. And they're not quite sure what heaven's like. I get all kinds of interesting things there. Is it true that in heaven we won't recognize anybody? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, Why would that be? I, I don't I don't know. Uh, over the years, the top the topics, the two topics that students will keep asking questions about generally until I say, I'm sorry, that was last class. We're finishing this class. We got to stop. <laughs> are um, sex and marriage and eternity. My, uh, my surmise is that one, these things are important to young people and two, no one talks about them. Mm-hmm. And so they, they have real questions. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? Does that mean this? Well, someone told me this. Well, what do you do in this situation? It just keeps going on and on. But when you think about, when you think about man realistically, which is to say biblically, man is the image of God. We're, we're told that. Let's make man in our image. What's the first thing? The first thing God says to man after saying, and he's, He's, we're going to make him in our image. Boom, there he is. And now, what does he say? Be fruitful and multiply. And replenish the earth. Have children, have children, have children. Or to put it a little more roughly. Have sex, have sex, have sex. You're my image. Have sex, have sex, have sex. Have to produce the human, produce my image in a godly fashion within the context of marriage. But do it. Have kids. Not... And get rid of that body as soon as you can so you can come and meet me. <laughs> That's yeah. suicide. Um, and, but going back, Rachel, to some of the things you said earlier, we have a culture that despises the body, bodily existence, doesn't want, doesn't want to define itself in terms of what used to be simple humanity. Man is a creature who, who works and talks and lives and breeds and marries and creates art and architecture and societies and laws in a physical universe and who worships God in terms and in the center and focus of all this. That's, we're trying to find man as something else and we're going to fail and it's going, it's already becoming disastrous Mm -hmm. and there's no hope in Plato. He does not give us anything to work with. We're, <laughs> if it, the answer all, doesn't start with man is a creature, who <laughs> we, yeah. we're not going to get where we need to go. Yeah. And creature, of course, means there's a creator. Mm-hmm. Um, a f- friend of ours, a pastor of one of the local churches, we, we ran into him um, at a place of eating, which is, his name escapes me at the moment, Panarios. And... Um, we were talking about this this concept of the gospel, and he pointed out something that once he said it was, oh, of course, but I had never thought of it in these terms. My wife had brought up uh, the process of, of um, uh, enrolling children in your Christian school and how important it was that the Christian school and the parents and the teachers believe in six-day creation. And this, our pastor friend said, yeah, you know, the last time the gospel's mentioned— as the gospel, in the book of Revelation, the end of the Bible, it's fear God and give him, and, and, and worship him, give him glory and worship him, who made the heavens and the earth and the fountains of water and the seas. There's nothing there about justification by faith, and not mm-hmm. to say it's not part of the message, or even the blood of Christ. It's fear God, 
who is the creator. Mm -hmm. The gospel brings us back to fearing God, who is our creator. Mm -hmm. A gospel that doesn't do that is not the gospel. And any kind of compromise with the gospel that says, and how you look at the physical universe and where it came from and how it's here and the underlying metaphysics behind it, ah, that's, you know, that's something for speculation, but it doesn't, it's not a salvation issue. But God thinks it's a salvation issue because the God Enough we worship. That he died. <laughs> that he died in mm -hmm. a physical body to save a real universe and to save a real people, to live as real people in a physical universe with him forever and ever. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we are just about out of time for this mm -hmm. discussion. Um, so unless you two have some recommendations that you are just chomping at the bit to share, I'm going to subvert our usual pattern and ask you a question. Okay. All right. Um, the true King Arthur has returned. Keeping in mind that he is from the sixth century, Mm -hmm. And we are in the 20, is it the 21st century now? Yes. <laughs> I can't yes. <laughs> track. <laughs> Things change so fast. Um, what is the first thing you do when you meet King Arthur? Oh, we, well, well, first of all, there's a question. Do we get to meet him? Yeah, you get to meet him. Well, see, the first obvious thing is there's this language difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, probably he speaks Latin. He probably speaks it a lot better than I do, in fact. So that's going to be an issue. I don't do Celtic at all. Um, so that's... Celtic is rough. Even the Celts don't do Celtic yeah. anymore. <laughs> so first I go find it. I, I grab a random <laughs> Roman Catholic priest who actually got A's in his Latin classes and says, come interpret for me. <laughs> um, uh, I don't... I, I think I ask him, so where you been? <laughs> What took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> and you're back. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to World be so War II was not Britain's greatest hour of need. What are, what brings you back now? I don't know. Rachel, how about you? I don't know that I have a great question to ask either, other than I would love to know which of the stories are actually ah, true. Yes. <laughs> can I tell the ones I know to you and you can tell me if any of them are true? Um, that would, yeah. That did, would did, did, we've been told that Lancelot and Guinevere had this thing, but we think that was a French invention. Can you give us the It would be on the that? French. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Intrigue and affairs, definitely yeah. French. Yeah. Now, my question for you is, why did you ask that question? It was an interesting question that came up on the internet this week. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, do I you just, want to know what I would do? What would you do? Yes. I we would get an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that would allow us to swear fealty to the true king of England if he returned. <laughs> <laughs> I think you would need more than a single amendment to pull that one off. I think we would probably I don't know. Be it's just one change. You can just renounce your American citizenship and well, if it comes a citizen to that. Of, but the thing is, he's king of Britain, not king of England. So there's a this problem there. Yeah, I mean, but we, Wales we would clearly him. seceded from a like not the true king, right? Yes, like like the true king would not have committed all the offenses listed in the oh, declaration. Okay, I see. So and so, yeah. what the true legal line of loyalty would put us back under the authority of King Arthur okay. in the event of right. his return. That's my legal theory. It's novel. <laughs> All right. Sounds All right. good. Well, thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure and a delight as always. Um, big thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband, to our financial supporters who keep the show rolling and pay for a nice editing software that we very much need. Um, thank you to our transcriptionist. She makes our show readable um, you can get that in your inbox by subscribing to our sub stack and if you'd like to get in touch with us you can always email us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com you can subscribe on whatever po podcast catcher you like to use if there's a place where we should be that we're not let us know use that email address haltingtowardszion at gmail.com and tell a friend about us thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time